the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We're going to start a new series these days about a character in the Bible that to me is like, you know how God calls David a man after his own heart? I'm going to speak about a man after my own heart. He's Jacob. That's not a good thing, unfortunately, because Jacob is somebody that you're going to see in the Bible that is more like us than any other character. And I want you to know, like everything that we struggle with, all the sins that we deal with, all the guilt, all the bad habits that we keep finding ourselves sucked into, that's Jacob. Jacob is the person that when you read it, if, you, if you're not aware of your true self, you look at him and you judge him in every act that he does because he's always doing something that isn't necessarily um, pleasing to God. But at the same time, you're going to see how God deals with him. So, as many people know, Jacob is the grandson of Abraham, and he's the twin of Esau. He's the son of Isaac. So Isaac had two kids. I'm going to read the passage. He had two kids, Jacob and Esau, and they're twins. And Jacob was the younger. And as we go through the life of Jacob, you're going to see that Jacob is, his life is so transformational. You see so much work of God trying to change him and to work in his life and to transform him. So if you guys have Bibles in your pews, we're going we're gonna to open up to Genesis chapter 25. Something that you're going to see about Jacob is that he's a very troubling character in the Old Testament. He's very conniving and very deceitful, but he's spiritual too. He has times of strong faith and he has times of fear. And he has... He's just like so many things are, are, are changing in his life that you see so much of ourselves in that. In Genesis chapter 25, we start from verse 21. It says, Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife, and because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah his wife conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I am about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Then Esau despised his birthright. Today in the introduction of the life of Jacob, I want to do a comparison between just in this and, and other things that we know about the story, between Esau and Jacob. Once you can understand their personalities, you'll be able to like live with the character. And it's important that when you read the Bible, is that you don't just read and take notes and meditate. You try to live with that character. So you say, you know, Jacob is, I don't know how many chapters in the Bible, it's like, like 24 chapters in the Bible. In these 24 chapters, I'm going to spend 24 days or 30 days living with Jacob. That all my events, all my days, I'm thinking about this person. One of the great Coptic fathers and Coptic authors of the church, he used to say, I would live with a character. When I write about St. Paul, I live with St. Paul. And that's how we study the Bible. Because if you just read and meditate, it can't work. You've got to put yourself in the life of the character that you're reading. So we're going to talk about the characters. We're going to compare some differences between the two. So Esau, the Bible tells us that he's 
hairy, okay? He's, he called him Red. He's hairy, and he was a hunter. As we see, he came in from the field, and he was a hunter. He was your rough, strong, manly type of guy. So his appearance, his appearance was that he was, had this like great bodily strength. And you got Jacob. All we know so far is that he's the younger. We know the Bible says he was a mild man dwelling in tents. It says Rebecca loved Jacob. And I kind of, the, the Bible is trying to hint at the character and the personality of Jacob. So you have Esau, man coming in from the field, man who is a hunter, man who's hungry. You know, he's like a, your, your man's man. Jacob, you know, his mom loves him, right? He's cooking, he's cooking stew. He's a very delicate boy. And that's something that you see, you're going to start to understand the character so that when you see the events of his life, you have to understand the type of person he is. Sometimes we think that all the characters are like John the Baptist or Elijah, you know, like they're just, they wear camel's hair and they're just hair out to here and they can do anything. Not Jacob. So whenever you read the events of Jacob's life, you have to understand the type of person he is. Jacob is not hairy, so he's smooth in skin. Probably not the strongest kid because he wasn't a hunter. He wasn't the outdoors man guy. He was no match for Esau if they were to have rusting matches. Their pursuits, their pursuits in life. Esau, like I said, was a hunter outdoorsman, the athlete type, manly. Jacob was a homeboy. It was like he, was a, like he, loved, he loved the home life. He loved the, the, the life of just being a homebody and hanging around the home, watching TV. I don't like to go out. I just want to be close to mom. This is the character that we're going to see that is going to get thrown into a completely different life. Um, not the most eventful. You would imagine that Esau... Being a hunter, he's adventurous, right? Because he has to go, and they weren't just hunting lamb and deer. There was lions, and there was all kinds of stuff that when you went hunting, it wasn't like with a shotgun. It was with a spear, or a sword, or a stick, and you were going to just wrestle with an animal. He was adventurous. Jacob, not that type. It's important that we understand who Jacob is as we go through his life. Because we might see this in ourselves, we might see it in our kids, we might see it in our family, our surroundings. But spiritually, you'll see it even more. Esau, what we know of the story is that like his father at the end of his life told him, as his eyes were dim, said, son, go and make me some food. Esau decided, I'm going to go hunt him. The best game in order that I could please my father. He was generous. He was the type of person that would do anything for his father. He was a good son. He was very sensual and he was a slave to his senses as we read in the last part Esau said to Jacob please feed me with that same red stew for I am weary Jacob said sell me your birthright as of this day and Esau said look I'm about to die so what is this birthright he could smell the tempting bowl of hats that was on the grill in the house I know if any of us would ever smell hats at this point in the season we would say get me out of here but to him he came in from hunting and he could smell food. He was sensual. He was very a man of seeking pleasure. Jacob, the Bible says that he was like a plain man. The Bible describes that in verse 27, 25 verse 27. It says, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. I know we might think of tents as roughing, roughing it, but at that time, the tent was like the, the nice, comfortable, you know, he was sitting in the tent, hanging out in the tent. He wasn't your type of outdoorsman. And so when you see, it says he's a plain man. He was just simple. But you see that he was crafty and deceiving. And the word Jacob actually means deceiver. And he was called deceiver because when he came out of his mother's womb, he came after Esau, he's the younger brother. He held on to Esau's heel. So they named him the word Jacob means the one who, if you look, I don't know if your Bibles have um, like footnotes. You'll see it in verse uh, 26. If they have footnotes, in verse 26 you'll see it's one who takes the heel, but it also means that he's a deceiver. The, the original word of Jacob means that he's a deceiver. 
It's important to know the name because the name of Jacob is going to change. His name is going to change. And you're going to see in the Bible when you read something about the name, you have to know that's the person's identity. It describes the person's identity, who they are or, or who their, their personality. His name was Jacob, deceiver. He had a strong faith and he could understand spiritual things. Jacob could understand the value of the birthright. I'm going to spend the rest of the time explaining what the birthright means because it's important to understand what Jacob saw and what Esau saw and how we are just like them. How we are just like them. He was um, hungry for the birthright more than anything. That he was willing to bargain and, and, and make a barter with his brother because he understood the value of the birthright. So what is the birthright? When you look at the stories of Esau and Jacob, there's misconceptions because we have to put on our spiritual minds as you read it. The, the Bible does not give a hint that the birthright was worldly prosperity. You know, so Esau didn't get the birthright, right? But we see that when he came to meet Jacob, he had 400 men and cattle. So he wasn't a poor person. So him having a birthright didn't mean that he was going to be poor. He had a lot of fortune. It says he had a beautiful wife. He had everything the world could offer. So the birthright had nothing to do with worldly prosperity. J uh, the next thing is, having the birthright didn't mean that you were going to be immune from days of sorrow or, or days of troubles. Jacob had the birthright. He spent his whole life running, right? As soon as he found out that his brother wanted to kill him because he stole his father's blessing, what did he do? He ran away. And then he went and he was deceived by Laban when he wanted to work for his wife seven years. He saw Rachel. He says, I'll work for her seven years. Ends up working for seven years, gets married, goes to consummate the marriage, wakes up in the morning, lifts up the veil and says, this is not the girl I worked for for seven years. Okay? And so, Jacob spent a lot of years as a slave. In the prime of his life, he was a slave. So the Bible gives us no hint that having the birthright, that's why it's important to understand when he sold the birthright, what was he after? To understand the heart of Jacob. It wasn't worldly prosperity. It didn't mean he was going to be immune from sorrow. We said he's a mama's boy. When he found out his brother wanted to kill him, his mama said, you have to run. He left everything that he was comfortable with running for his life, the birthright didn't protect him from these things. The third thing was, what it was is it was a spiritual inheritance. It gave the right to Jacob of being the priest of the house. So whoever got the birthright was going to be the priest of the tribe or the clan. It was also going to give him the right or the blessings of Abraham. Abraham's blessings were going to be transferred. The person with the birthright was the one that the Messiah was going to come from. And so Jacob saw and he understood that the birthright was a spiritual thing. It was something that wasn't seen, right? The things that he was going to have weren't visible, tangible things that he could hold on to. He was somebody that was going to know the divine secrets, and have the promises. He was somebody that was going to have power with God. The person that was going to have the birthright or the blessing of Abraham was going to have influence with God and influence with man, just like Abraham was. He saw how, you know, the Bible gives us the, the impression that Abraham lived, like Abraham, I'm sorry, Jacob got to live with his grandfather Abraham until he was about 18. So I would imagine he got to hear lots of stories from Abraham about the good old days, about when he got to argue with God and bargain with God about not destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. And every time I put a condition before God, he would listen to me. And he had influence with God. So Jacob understood the values of the birthright. He was going to be the heir to the promises made to Abraham. So how do we share, how do we get the birthright? It's important for us to understand how the birthright is relevant to us and then what happened in the story? So you receive the birthright through your baptism. Actually before your baptism. As soon as you accept Christ, 
as one accepts Christ even before their baptism. To them, they are given the right to become children of God. So as soon as I accept, I'm given the right to be baptized because I've accepted in faith. And then you're baptized. And when you are baptized and chrismated and you receive the Holy Spirit, you are adopted as a son. You are no longer a slave. And because of that, there's so many th rights that the birthright gets. You have the right, first of all, to be redeemed. You have the right to be saved. As long as you are a son, you have the right to be saved because you're children of God. And that's something that I, we have to understand. It is our right because we have expressed our faith and we are living with Him. It is our birthright that we get to be saved because we have come under the blood of Christ in baptism. We have the right to be forgiven. We have the right to share in the glory of God. When you were baptized, you were given the right to not just be like loved by God, not loved by God. That's a very minimal thing. Not to say that the love of God is minimal, but, but there's more in that. Christ wanted to share with us His glory. Not just give us a portion of His glory, that we would be sitting with Him on His throne. And the Bible talks about that. So God wanted to share His glory with us. That's our right in the birthright. The right to overcome sin. To be more than conquerors over our enemies. When we became sons of God, we were transferred from under the reign of Satan, the reign of darkness, the power of darkness, into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And we read that in Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, 12 and 13. So then what happens? What's the story? Jacob and Esau are together. Jacob is cooking his wonderful bowl of stew, of atz. And Esau comes running in. He says, I'm weary. Give me some of that stew. So Jacob, right away, doesn't say, you know, like, I'll race you for it. Or I'll, you know, let's play, you know, paper, scissors, rocks. He says, right away, he knew. He knew what he wanted. And you see that in his approach. It says in verse 30, sorry, verse 31, but Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. All he said was, I want a bowl of stew. He had on top of his mind, give me your birthright. And how did Esau respond? Esau said, so the boy, it's, he said in verse 33, Verse 32, and Esau said, look, I am about to die, so what is this birthright to me? You see, Esau had his mind fixed on physical things. He had his mind fi uh, fixed on what he could see, what he could hold, what he can enjoy now. When you read this story, you're thinking, Esau's dumb. Esau's so dumb. Why would he give up something so valuable in, in his in God's eyes and in his eyes in this great promise of Abraham for a bowl of stew we look at him and we say you're so stupid but when you look at the life or the choice of Esau and Jacob I wonder which one we are in the story you see Jacob he had his eye on the birthright we said the birthright gives him the right to become the priest of the tribe or the clan or the family. He's going to become the spiritual leader. And he wanted to become a spiritual leader. He wanted to become the one that is connected to God. The one that knows the secrets of God. You see, Abraham knew the secrets of God. Right? God, when he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, how can I hide this thing from Abraham? How can I hide what I'm going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah from Abraham? The man of God who has the birthright knows the secrets of God. Now I want to ask you, what's more important to you in your life? The birthright? The right to become the child of God? The right to have God share His secrets with you? The right to have this intimate fellowship? The right to be able to influence God through your prayers? The right to overcome your enemies spiritually? or our sensual pleasures. And we see this every day. We see this every day. I'm not talking about the big stuff, but we're thinking about every day, 
Because we have the Holy Spirit, we have this conscience inside of us that says, ignore the thought, ignore the temptation, flee, run. We get the voice, right? We always hear it. But something says, I'm sorry, but the sensual pleasure is worth much more. And what does the devil say? He told Esau, he says, look, I'm about to die. The devil tells us that we are going to die without the sensual pleasures that we have. The devil tries to sell us in that way. And this is where you need to ask yourself if you are Jacob or if you are Esau. How much is the birthright valuable to you? The right to become God's man or God's woman. Jacob said, this is what I want more than anything. As soon as he had the chance to negotiate with Esau, I mean, in Jacob's right mind, is the bowl of lentil stew. Did he really think that Esau was going to give up his birthright for lentil stew? He knew how indulgent Esau was in his own pleasures. I think sometimes the way that we leave our li live our lives, we're kind of stuck in the same thing. The devil knows very well this person will sell their soul in a second for some physical pleasure, some sensual pleasure, for pleasure of the stomach and the flesh when it comes to fasting. Sometimes the temptation is too much. You just say, sorry, Coptic Church, sorry, God, whatever. The burger is too tempting or whatever it may be is too tempting. And we negotiate and the birthright is way much more valuable than the right to influence God. The right to stir the heart of God. That's what we have in the birthright. The Bible says that Esau despised his birthright. How much do you value your potential in Christ? Think about Esau, the way we described Esau. He was strong. He was very able. He was an athlete. He was intelligent. He was handsome. He had a good build. He had so much potential for great things. But yet, he despised his birthright. And it's the same thing for each and every one of us. You have so much potential to have the birthright from God. To be like Abraham, to be like Isaac, Isaac, to be like the one that can change the heart of God when it came to destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. When it came to be the one that God fulfills His promises to Abraham. And the power that God gave Abraham when he went to save Lot from five kings that, or, or, or four, five kings that took over four kings. And he, Abraham with his men, was able to save them. Abraham had that power. And Jacob said, I want that more than anything. How many of us are like that? We have to be honest with ourselves. It's one thing to say, I want it, but I'm just weak. I want it more than anything, but I'm battling with the wars that are inside of me. Are you that person that says, I want God more than anything, but I'm so weak? In that point, you're going to see Jacob in, in his life. We're going to study the life of Jacob and you're going to see even though he wanted it more than anything Jacob was just as low of a person as, 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 as the lowest of us. He made some of the worst mistakes some of the dumbest decisions he had a deceiving heart he was very crafty he was very conniving and to think how God dealt with him because he saw that he wanted his birthright more than anything which one are you? Are you the one that despises your birthright? Are you the one that says, spiritual life, who cares about spiritual life? It's time to live life. It's time to enjoy things. It's time to give the flesh whatever it wants. Seize the day, right? But the devil is telling you, the devil is telling us, if you don't eat this bowl of stew, you're going to die. If you don't give pleasure to your body, it's like you're going to die without it. Jacob, more than anything, wanted the birthright. You see, when you look at the mistake that Esau made, bowl of stew, wasn't adultery, wasn't killing, he wasn't like Cain and Abel, he wasn't like, you know, these wicked things, people that we read about in the Bible that did like wicked things or, 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 or huge sins. Just a bowl of stew, 
and he lost the birthright. Just a bowl of stew. The Bible talks about the little foxes that climb or that, that crawl in the vineyard and destroy a vineyard. What happens is they put gates around vineyards so that no big animals will come and destroy it. But what really sneaks in and destroys the vineyard are the small foxes that can crawl through any small crevice. We have to beware of the little foxes that destroy our heart. The smallest decisions can result in the greatest damage. The smallest decisions. The smallest impulsive decision can make the greatest damage. Greatest damage. Things that you don't even see. There's no value in them. Music. I listen to music. Maybe it's not good music. It's not bothering anyone. I'm not hurting anyone. It's just music. You don't realize it's just a little fox. You can justify listening to any type of music, but what it does is it creeps into the heart and it stirs up impure thinking, impure language, sin. It's just music. I'm not talking about the big stuff. I'm talking about the little stuff. The little stuff that creeps in and makes damage of the heart. I hear it all the time. There's so many things. The uncontrolled passions that are done in secret. It's just one time that I'm going to, to fulfill this fleshly desire. Whatever it may be. It's just one time. It's one time. It's one little mistake. I can get over it. But be careful. Because the beginning of it can hook you just like this. We can get hooked on the most insignificant things because we're not aware. It's such a trick from the devil. It's just the bowl of stew. Esau saw the bowl of stew and he says, it's just a bowl of stew. Come on, how, how seriously is this birthright? Like anyone going to take this, this deal that I made with Jacob? The Bible says that there was no room for repentance for Esau. doesn't mean that he couldn't repent and God wasn't going to accept him, his soul. But there was no room for repentance to get the birthright from his father again. It was too late. There are some times that things that we do, there are consequences to our sins that make it too late. Not too late to repent, but the consequence that you're going to suffer with. In the small fox, I'm not talking about the big stuff. I'm talking about the little things that creep into our heart. These are the things that cause the biggest damage. Many of us make all types of assumptions, but we are not like faithful in what is least. We think that I am great and, for example, I'll give you an example. A lot of us, when we hear about martyrdom, we think maybe if I was, you know, like threatened to be killed for Christ's sake, I think I would do it. So I'm saying I'm willing to be burned at the stake, but I don't pray in my room at night. Or another thing is we'll say, for example, like, I would love to have been Peter and preach at Pentecost and, and convert 3,000 person people, but you won't talk to the one individual. And I think we are not faithful in what is least. So there's the sin part of it, in indulging in the small sins, and then there's the like work with God, we won't even be faithful in the small things. So we have to take steps in the small things. And that is exactly how we learn faithfulness. He who is faithful in what is least will be faithful in what is most. That's what the Bible tells us. We need to understand ourselves more and be honest. The smallest things are the truest tests of your character. We just read the small passage Esau coming in from the field, telling his brother, give me a bowl of stew. Jacob says what? Give me your birthright. He says, take the birthright. Who cares about the birthright? I'm starving to death. You see the character of Esau in the smallest things. I think a lot of us consider ourselves faithful when we're faithful in not falling in the big things. A lot of times, sometimes people come to confess to me, and they'll confess like one thing. You know, like I haven't seen them for three months. And they come, they confess one thing. I'm like, you only did one sin? Wow. You only did one sin? And it's the sin that gives them the most guilt. And everything else, like, who cares? Like, I just, 
once I can overcome this big sin that causes the most guilt in my life, that's it. I'm like, no. We need to get to the point where we are repenting over the small sins, the little things. And those are the things that will show our most, the truest character inside of us. That's what you see in Esau and Jacob. The smallest things are the truest sets of our character. I pray that we would understand how to live like Jacob, even though Jacob had a lot of weaknesses. And in this next series, you're going to study the life of Jacob and you are going to discover the monsters in Jacob. And you're going to be like, man, this is a man after my own heart. He's just like me. Same stupid mistakes over and over and over again. You're going to see how God deals with him. It's amazing. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Remember that we start the Bible study at 7.30 sharp and we're going to end at 8 sharp. Do our best to try to come early in order that we can attend the full thing, especially the life of Jacob. Life of Jacob is the best. It has the best stories. It's the deepest. It's so spiritual. It's so life-changing. I encourage you to try to come um, from the beginning at 7.30. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our Master and Savior, dear Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we come here before you. As we read the life of Jacob and we see this, this bargain between Jacob and Esau, we see so much of ourselves in Esau. Willing up to give the most precious things, Lord, that matter to our soul up for the things that bring the most pleasure, Lord, to our flesh. That for the cheapest things, Lord, we're, we're willing to sell our right to become children of God, Lord. I pray that we would see the value in spiritual things, things that are not seen. Draw us away, Lord, from what is, what is sensual and what is all about physical pleasure, what is of the flesh. Help us, Lord, just to kill the flesh, Lord. As St. Paul said, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with all its passions and desires. Grant that we could do the same, Lord, that we can be like Jacob, hungry and desperate, Lord, desperate for what is holy in your eyes, that we would have influence with you, Lord. We would have power over our enemies. That we would become children of God, Lord. That we would be powerful and that we would know the secrets of God. We thank you, Lord, for this example that you've given us in Jacob, Lord. Help us, Lord, to... Sell everything, Lord, that we would have the birthright, Lord, to become children of God. We pray this in your holy and precious name, through the presence of St. Mary, St. John, St. Mark, all the saints who have pleased since the beginning. Make us, O Lord, worthy to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Now the love of God the Father, grace of His only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the gift and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all.